Welcome, friends. Good morning. Welcome to The Well. My name is Ryan Gear. I have the privilege of being the pastor here. And if you're new with us, you're our guest. We're thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you'd like to let us know you're here, you can text the word WELCOME to 480-530-7234. It'll text you back with a digital connect card. You can fill it out. Tell us about yourself, and it, it will also um, put you on our email list. So every Friday, you'll get an email from me, and you'll get more information about the well. So thank you for being here. And uh, today, we're continuing, uh, actually, we're concluding our series, Leadership, uh, talking about how everything rises and falls on leadership, and you are a leader. We'll get to that here uh, in a second, but um, like I said last week, we during the quarantine have been completely dependent on Facebook for our live stream. So we, we gather live on Facebook every Sunday uh, for our service. And um, some folks have maybe seen the social dilemma. Some, some folks have, have been pulling back from social media over the past few months or years anyway. And so what we've been doing is testing multiple live stream platforms where we can gather on a Sunday morning live and and watch the service but also communicate with each other through a chat function and so we're, we're testing uh, those cert, those uh, platforms again this sunday and we hope to be able to make an announcement next week and then our hope is that all of us in the well all of you who watch irregularly wherever you are in the country that you would kind of migrate with us to that new platform where there is a chat function you can sign in you can communicate with everybody during the service, and uh, you don't have to have a Facebook account to, to be part of it. So um, watch for that announcement next week. We're excited about it. We're just doing kind of a final test this Sunday or today, and, uh, and we hope to, to start moving to that, that new live stream platform. So uh, speaking of Facebook, I did receive a, a message on Facebook uh, this week from a young woman in Virginia. So I'm in, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Virginia is across the country. And she messaged me thanking me and all of you for the well and for, and for putting these services online. And I want to read the message that, sh that she sent. And it won't be on the screen, but I encourage you to just listen. And those of you who have you know, been a part of the well, serving, giving, making the well happen, I hope that, that you... Uh, feel fulfillment as you listen to her message that she sent this week. She wrote, I have been struggling for quite some time in my faith. Growing up in church, I knew what was expected, but through my travels and experiences, I have met people of all walks of life who believe differently sometimes, and I don't necessarily think they're wrong. So I've been trying to carve my way through how to be a good person of faith, as well as experiencing all that life has to offer while being cognizant of other beliefs. She says, I often question my faith, and when I lean on the pillars of my faith, I, she means like the people around her that have been Christians for a long time or something. She says, I am often put down for being open to other ideas, so it can be discouraging. I have prayed for something that will bring me back, and I have to say, your services from the well are so wonderful. I love that you speak on real matters such as leadership at work, parenting, homosexuality, etc. It is truly inspiring to see the network you have grown, and I have been avidly following and trying to share. Thank you for all you continue to do. That message is from a 30-something woman in Virginia to all of you who make the well happen. I hope that means as much to you as it does to me, and thank you for writing that. So... Today, we're wrapping up this, this series, Leadership, and the most prominent leadership coaches that I'm aware of, at least, all believe that, that leadership is influence. They define leadership as influence. You may not think you're a leader. You, you might look to some other you know, person and think, well, that's what a leader looks like. You may, you may not think of yourself as a leader, but leadership is influence, if that's true then you are a leader. Why? Because everybody influences somebody. If you're a parent, 
you influence your kids, even if you don't feel like you do at times, even if they're in online school and, and it's rough right now, you influence your children. You influence everybody around you, no matter where you are, your work, your extended family, your circle of friends, your church, your community, online, in social media. You influence everybody who comes in contact with you. And because of that, you are a leader. Now, of course, there are leaders who are more effective, that have a wider influence. Of course, that's true. But you have influence and you are a leader. And then another thing that we've been talking about every week here during the series is that everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. Every company. Every product. Every show you watch. Everything that's man-made that you see. Every idea that you've been taught existed in the mind of a leader before it was brought to fruition. Everything rises and falls on leadership here in the United States as we face a presidential election. Everything rises and falls on leadership, if that's true. If leadership is influence, and that means you're a leader, and everything rises and falls on leadership, then what more important thing is there to talk about than becoming the best leader you can possibly be? And today, we're talking about leading your country. Leading your country. Now, I suppose there are people who saw this title and they thought, I'm not the president. I'm not a member of Congress. I'm not a leader in, in my country. What does that mean? What does that have to do with me? Well, as you, as you know, there is this document called the Constitution that's very important here in 2020. And in the preamble to the Constitution, we read this. We, the people. The preamble to our Constitution begins with we, the people, and establishes the fact that we're a government by the people for the people. We are the government in the United States. So we, the people. So are you a people? I think you are. You're an influence. Everything rises and falls on leadership, and you are a people. What that means is you are a leader in your country. We all are leaders in our country. Our Constitution says so. We, the people, are the government, are the leaders of this country. You have power. You have a say. You have a vote. You can determine the future of this country. Now, the truth is, our democracy has always been under assault from people who have inordinate amounts of money and power, things that buy more influence. Our democracy has always been under attack, and we are dependent on people who realize that we are a government of the people, that we are the leaders of our country in order to preserve our democracy. We fought a war because part of our country wanted to own other people and use them for free labor. And the cultural divisions from that war still inform our politics today in 20. 20. Minority populations have had a harder time in this country because they're marginalized with the, by those with more money and power influence. People who had access to, to uh, you know, more money and, and to influence the government, they, they use their influence to push other people down. That's part of the story of our country. How will you use your influence? We the people. We are the leaders of our country, but we the people always strive to make progress and as the preamble says, to form a more perfect union. So you are a leader in your country. Well, here we are in a presidential election year, uh, nearing the end of one of the most trying years in American history. We have a bitterly uh, divided electorate we have nightly protests across the country, protesting injustice, businesses going bankrupt, an economy that is in a recession and it is, is volatile right now. We have a pandemic that has killed over 200,000 Americans and will kill how, who, knows how many knows, uh, who knows how many more. We don't know what we're facing this fall or this winter. We have a Supreme Court uh, nominating hearing 
that's going to happen as people are beginning to vote in the presidential election. Now, as a pastor giving a sermon, I don't endorse presidential candidates. I can talk about issues. I can talk about ideals. I can talk about facts. So one of the facts uh, of 2020 right now is that the president, again, indicated that he may not concede the election if he loses. And uh, that's an important comment. Now, I don't think that's true. I think those comments serve as a distraction. But that's a fact about where we are in 2020. And so what does it look like to be a leader who influences our country toward the ideals we read about in the preamble to our Constitution? Let's, let's read it. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So what does it look like to be a leader who influences our country toward these ideals in the Constitution? To establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, the well-being of society, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Let me ask you, if you were going to give the United States a grade in 2020 on how well we're living out these goals in our Constitution, what grade would you give the United States? How would you grade our performance uh, as a country in 2020 and how we're living out these ideals in the preamble to our Constitution? An A, a B, a C? Some of you are wondering, is there, is there a grade lower than F? Can I get a G, Pat? Perhaps an H? How, how would you grade our performance as a country living up to these ideals in 2020? We do pretty well providing for the common defense. The United States spends more on national defense than China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea, and Brazil combined. Defense spending ends up being about 35 to 40% of our federal budget. So we do pretty well providing for the common defense. What about the rest of the ideals in the preamble? How are we doing with establishing justice and ensuring domestic tranquility here in 2020? promoting the general welfare or well-being of the citizens of the United States of America. How are we doing in 2020? And securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, our children. How are we doing with that in 2020? Well, 200,000 Americans have died from a pandemic. Our response has been the worst in the world. We can look at other countries like Canada or other countries around the world who have done a far better job of containing the virus. How does that affect the general welfare? the general well-being of this country. There are nightly protests in the streets now because we've continued to see cell phone videos of authorities using excessive violence against American citizens who are black. That's been a continual occurrence throughout the history of our country, but now it's on video. How, how is that affecting the domestic tranquility? How are we doing in 2020 providing for domestic tranquility? peace in our country. Ethnic minorities have one-tenth the household income of white families, or the household wealth, rather, of white families. The Brookings Institute uh, said a close examination of wealth in the United States finds evidence of staggering racial disparities. At $171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family at $17,150. That was from 2016. Hispanic household wealth is nearly the same as black household wealth. With that kind of wealth disparity between ethnic groups, how are we doing? Providing for the general welfare of the citizens of the United States. And, and it's also true that the typical white family is struggling. It's harder to stay in the middle class or work your way from the working class up to the middle class. Wealth inequality among white families has skyrocketed since the 1980s. How are we doing? Providing for the general welfare. With the death of, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
Uh, we will have a new Supreme Court nominee or Supreme Court justice, and uh, we can talk about facts. The NPR PBS Marist poll found that 77% of Americans support Roe v. Wade with varying opinions on adding restrictions. No restrictions or some restrictions. So a large majority of Americans support that. And it's an issue connected to women's rights and a debate about when life begins. How will that affect the well-being of women? Especially poor women, especially poor women living in the South. We have widening political divisions in this country that I believe are largely because we have two medias in this country. We have a conservative media and a liberal media. If you're a conservative, you watch a certain cable news channel or you, you read certain blogs. If you're a progressive, you watch a certain cable news channel or you read certain blogs. We can't agree on what the facts are anymore. We can't agree on what reality looks like anymore. You'll, you'll talk to a family member or a friend and they'll say something. And you're like, where do they even get that? What are they talking about? It's because they live in a different reality than you. They, they consume a different media than you do, a different, a different source of facts, a different source of reality than you do. I, I don't understand how a, a country can continue with two medias dividing our country. So since you're a leader in your country, what do you think we could do to bring that grade up to an A? About how we're performing and how, how, how we're living out the ideals in the preamble to our Constitution. If you're a, a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ watching this, the question for us is, as a follower of Jesus, what, what do we believe about these ideals that we see in our Constitution. As followers of Jesus, are these ideals worth living into? And, and, and what, what does Jesus teach us about what it looks like to live in a, a better country, to form a more perfect union, to always be about working towards these ideals? There's this perception that Christians in America all vote for the, they all vote the same way. Um, Many of you, like me, come from a more conservative evangelical background, and you've been shocked but not surprised to see the difference in evangelical Christians in the 90s and how they related to the president, and evangelical Christians in 2020 and how they relate to the president. We used to hear things like character matters, and, and, uh, and I just remember back in, in the 90s, you know, M MTV was like the great evil you know, when you were a teenager in the 90s, like the biggest threat to American Christianity was, was Britney Spears in a crop top. And uh, I remember what evangelical Christians used to say about the president in the 90s and, and how that is so much different than, than how they speak about the president now. And many of you, you're shocked but not surprised. There's been this, this incredible twist, this reversal. But because of that, there's this idea that Christians all vote the same way in America. That's not true. We get that because there are people who have very loud voices that make it on TV and, 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 and uh, they proclaim their beliefs very loudly. And so we kind of get the idea that the group is bigger than they actually are. And, and they kind of have this, this perception of an outsized influence. Pew Research says that 25% of Americans are evangelical Christians. 15% are mainline Christians, think more like, you know, Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, etc., Episcopalians. 7% are historically black Protestant, and 20% are Catholic. What that means is there are more Christians in America who are not evangelicals than those who are. I want to make sure we, we really hear that. There are more Christians in America who are not evangelicals than those who are. Christians in America do not vote all the same way. Even among more evangelically people, they don't all vote the same way. 80% of evangelicals vote the same way, but 20% don't. And then evangelicals are a, are a minority of Christians 
in the United States. Back in 2017, I was invited to, uh, to travel to D.C. by a largely evangelically uh, food relief organization called Food for the Hungry. They're based here in Phoenix, and, and uh, we went to Washington to essentially lobby members of Congress to increase federal aid to the poor here at home and uh, in other countries. At that time, the administration had slashed the federal aid budget, and these evangelical Christian people were going to D.C. to say, wait a second, we, we have a responsibility to help people in this country and around the world, and we would like to see that, that federal aid put back into the budget. And so uh, it was a great time. We got to hang out in the, uh, the Senate building and walk in the tunnels under, underground where you see senators stopped by reporters and, and interviewed. And it was just this great experience. Uh, one of the days you know, we had lunch together and um, just to illustrate the difference of opinion among more evangelically people, uh, one woman there said that she believed that, that uh, Donald Trump was elected president because God ordained that so that he could cleanse America. That, that God made Donald Trump president so that he could cleanse America. Cleanse is, that's a, that's a loaded word. But then another person on the, on the same trip, who was a, a missionary doctor actually, who had served in Africa for years, said, cleanse it with what? Sewer water? He's like, Trump's dirtier than anybody else. So in an evangelical Christian group, there was a stark difference of opinion. Not all Christians in America vote the same way. So as a follower of Jesus, what does it look like to live into these ideals? Do we believe in these ideals? And how can a follower of Jesus be a leader in our country? Well, the Constitution says that we, the people, are to establish justice. So many times now I've talked about the word justice in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and also the New Testament, it's the Hebrew word tzedakah, tzedakah. Like the T and the, Z and the S form one sound together, tzedakah. And tzedakah is translated in English, justice and righteousness. What it means is, to, what justice means is to do what is right by everybody. It means to look at everybody in the room, everybody in the house, everybody in the country, and think about what is right for everybody here. What's the best thing for them? What would lead to flourishing and dignity? That's what justice means. Justice and righteousness, tzedakah, throughout the scripture, one of the most uh, common concepts throughout the entire Bible is justice, righteousness. It finds its way throughout the entire Bible. There are about 2,000 verses in the Bible about justice and righteousness and people who live in poverty, people who experience inequality. The Bible says more about the issue of, of wealth and poverty and equality and justice and righteousness than just about anything else. Would you get that idea listening to some of the most vocal Christians in the United States today? But remember, not all Christians vote the same way. There is diversity even among evangelically Christians as well. The first occurrence of Zedekah is in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 18. And it's in the story of Abraham. And uh, God makes a promise to Abraham and says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord? by doing what is right and just, tzedakah. What's the way of the Lord? Tzedakah, justice and righteousness. I've, I've called Abraham, I've blessed him that all of his descendants, Abrahamic religions, Jews, Muslims, Christians, that they would bless the world by doing what? Keeping the way of the Lord, which is tzedakah, justice and righteousness, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Another example occurs in, in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 10 when the queen of Sheba, which is modern Yemen and Ethiopia, visited King Solomon. Solomon was king over Israel and Judah. 
And, and she says to Solomon, Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king. Why has he made you king? To maintain justice and righteousness. Tzedakah. The belief here is that God made Solomon king in order to maintain justice and righteousness. In America, you and I are the kings and queens. We the people. We're a government, as Lincoln said, by the people, for the people, but of the people. We are the kings and queens in America. So what is the purpose of government? If we're reading the Bible, what is the purpose of government? It's to maintain tzedakah, justice and righteousness. That is the purpose of government. So if one of our ideals in the preamble is to establish justice, do followers of Jesus believe in establishing justice? Yeah, we do. Yeah. We believe in establishing justice and righteousness. I used to write for uh, the Huffington Post. I used to blog occasionally for the Huffington Post. And uh, my proudest writing moment was being quoted by the late journalist Cokie Roberts. Cokie Roberts was a legendary NPR journalist, and she passed away in September of last year. And, and she wrote a syndicated column that appeared in, in newspapers around the country. And in December of 2015, she, uh, she wrote uh, a column entitled, Remember the Entire Christmas Story. And this was in a time in 2015, before the last presidential election, when there was a lot of talk about immigrants to the United States and whether immigration and Im immigrants perform, uh, uh, present a danger to the United States. And there was talk of building walls and, and keeping immigrants out. And there were governors who were claiming they could keep immigrants out of their state, which isn't true. Governments, governors don't have control of the borders of their, their states. And, and Cokie Roberts wrote this column entitled, Remember the Entire Christmas Story, about how the Holy Family, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, fled to Egypt and, and they had to be welcomed into a foreign land in the Christmas story. And she quoted four religious leaders in this, in this column. Laith Anderson, who was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Matthew Sorens, who uh, was uh, from a group called World Relief. Pope Francis and Ryan Gear. You remember the Sesame Street song, One of these things is not like the other. When I, when I read her, her column, I was like, What? I, I was just, I mean, you can understand why it would be one of the, you know, the proudest moments in my writing, quote unquote, career. And here's what she, she quoted. She said, writing in the Huffington Post, Pastor Ryan Gear of Chandler, Arizona, cites Jesus' admonition in Matthew, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And here's, here's what I said. Jesus meant the least of these to include foreigners, immigrants, and strangers, said Gear. In other words, when we don't welcome the foreigner, Jesus takes it personally. That's from Matthew 25, that famous passage where Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, an immigrant, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. That Jesus identifies himself with the most vulnerable people in society. And when, when we refuse justice and righteousness, Jesus takes it personally. Whatever you did for these, you did it for me. That's how Jesus feels about justice and righteousness and well-being and domestic tranquility, peace. If we're followers of Jesus, how are we doing leading our country into these ideals that we say we believe in? The ancient rabbis said there were three classes of people. All human beings can be lumped into one of three groups. The first group was the uh, Zadokim. These are the righteous. These are people who practice tzedakah. They practice justice and righteousness. They look around and they want to do what's right by everybody. They want to provide for domestic tranquility, peace 
and the general welfare, well-being of people. They look around and they say, who, who isn't experiencing justice and righteousness right now? Who isn't experiencing domestic tranquility? Who isn't experiencing peace right now? They look around and they say, what can I do about that? The Zadokim, the righteous, those who practice tzedakah. The second group the rabbis said were the Benunim. These are the indifferent, the apathetic. People who look around and they see people who are hurting. They see protests taking place. They see the cell phone videos. They see the, the dramatic uh, skyrocketing of wealth inequality in this country and how wealth is concentrate, concentrated at the top and so many are just struggling. They look around and they say, I'm doing okay. So I'm not worried about it. Matter of fact, I, I don't like hearing about all of this racism talk. Yeah, psh. Uh, yeah, when can, we, when can we stop dividing our country talking about wealth inequality? These are the people who believe that addressing problems is oppression. If, if, you, if you point out an act of racism, that means you're a racist. That's always existed in this country. Slaveholders in, 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 before the Civil War claimed to be oppressed. Slave, over, slave owners claimed that Lincoln was oppressing them. They were the true victims. Those poor slaveholders. That's always existed in this country, but the Benunim are the indifferent. Who look at the suffering of other people and they think, right, I'm okay. As long as my 401k is good, I'm all right. I'm not worried about it. The Benunim. The indifferent. The third category. The Rashaim. The unrighteous. These are people who just intentionally act against righteousness and justice. They just... They just they manipulate others to, to benefit themselves. They're all about gaming the system. They're, they just, they just want to con the population to get as much money and power and influence as they possibly can and just hurt everybody else in the process. We can think of names of people who fit in this category. But here's the thing. And the ancient rabbi said in the final judgment, there isn't going to be three categories. Only two. The Benunim in the middle, the indifferent, they will be absorbed into the Rashaim category of evildoers. Evil doing, doing nothing, being indifferent, is the same as being unrighteous in the final analysis. And everybody will be put in two classes. The Tzedakim, those who looked around and said, oh, how can I bring justice and righteousness to the people around me? and those who didn't. This finds its way into the New Testament. Jesus said in, in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. That's Matthew seven twelve, the golden rule. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. And then Jesus goes on to say, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They claim to be good Christian people and to be all about God and the Bible and Christian values, but they're false prophets. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, but by their fruit you will recognize them, by their results. And these rabbis said that, that those who were unrighteous were like trees that didn't bear fruit. The indifferent or the evildoers, they were like trees and they had so much potential, but they didn't bear any fruit. And so they were just cut down by God in the final judgment. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. People who claim to be Christians, people who claim to follow Jesus, you'll recognize them not by their words, but by their actions. Are they concerned about the things God is concerned about? Like Zedekah, justice and righteousness and domestic tranquility and the welfare, the general well-being of people. That's how you'll know who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus makes it pretty plain. He goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 and they, and they talk about God and they talk about Jesus in the Bible. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Tzedakah. Justice and righteousness. Jesus goes on. Many will say to me on that day, the final judgment, 
Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, preach, talk about you? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you reshaim, evildoers. God is concerned about justice and righteousness. What it means to follow Jesus Christ is being somebody who looks around and says, I want to be a Zedekim. I, I want to be somebody who, who practices justice and righteousness. I want to bring that into this world. I want to partner with God with, with my life to bring that. And that's all that counts to God. In the final, just, in the final judgment, how have I lived towards the ideals of, of Zedekah, justice and righteousness? That's what it means to be a Christian. That's it. Is that what it means to be a Christian in the United States? To some, yeah. But we see so many loud people who don't seem to be concerned about justice and righteousness and seem to be offended by people who are. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, we talked about you. We, we held up Bibles. We talked a good game about being good Christian people and believing in Christian family values. Jesus will say to them, depart from me, you reshaim. You were not not interested in tzedakah, justice and righteousness. I never knew you. What would it look like for followers of Jesus to live into the ideals and the preamble to our constitution? It looks like Matthew seven twelve. the golden rule. So in everything, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. That's what it's all about, folks. Jesus said, treat other people the way you want to be treated. You look around and you see who is suffering, who is, who, who is not being served by our society, who's not getting a fair deal. And I want, to, I want to roll up my sleeves and get involved and work for justice and righteousness, doing what is right by everybody. That's what it means for a follower of Jesus to live into our ideals and to to just be a follower of Jesus, period. C.S. Lewis is one of the most revered authors by many Christians in the United States. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, of course, and, and he wrote a famous book in Christian circles called Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes about what he calls Christianity and water, we would say watered down Christianity, watered down Christianity. And he said, it's the kind of Christianity that is indifferent and apathetic. It's just casual Christianity. People hold on to Christianity and water, watered down Christianity. And they're, they're not, they go to church. Yeah, but they're not bothered to be challenged by their faith. They, they just kind of go with the flow of whatever social circles they're in, if, if, if they're in kind of a culture war, Christianity, church environment, they just kind of go with that. It's just kind of whatever is convenient for me. How does it affect me? That's watered down Christianity, Christianity and water. They baptize what they already believe. Instead of allowing the scripture and, and the values of Jesus, tzedakah, what Jesus says it's all about, instead of allowing that to inform their Christian walk, they just kind of baptize whatever they already believe, whatever political views they already hold, however they grew up, and they just kind of make that Christian somehow. They just kind of conflate their pre-existing values with Christianity. That's Christianity and water. As C.S. Lewis would say, watering down Christianity. By far, the most influential evangelical leader of the 20th century was Billy Graham. Billy Graham is almost personally responsible for leading a religious revival in America that started in the 1950s. And and we are essentially coming coming to the end of now. And he learned his lesson about mixing faith and politics in the 1970s. And he began changing his views. He didn't always get it right, that's for sure. But it might be shocking to some people to hear what Billy Graham said about mixing Christianity and politics, and specifically Christianity and right-wing politics. 
in the February 1st, 1981 cover story of Parade Magazine, he was asked about conversations with the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who started Liberty University, who, who organized in the late 1970s what, would be called the, what he called the moral majority. And, and they, were, they were like the beginning of right-wing Christianity, people who were celebrating yesterday with the Supreme Court nominee. That's the group, really, that was started by Jerry Falwell in the late 1970s. And Parade Magazine asked Billy Graham what he thought about this Christian right movement, this moral majority. Here's what Billy Graham said. He said, I told Jerry Falwell to preach the gospel. That's our calling. I want to preserve the purity of the gospel and the freedom of religion in America. I don't want to see religious bigotry in any form. Liberals organized in the 60s and conservatives certainly have the right to organize in the 80s. But it would disturb me if there was a wedding between the religious fundamentalists and the political right. The hard right has no interest in religion except to manipulate it. It would be unfortunate if people got the impression all evangelicals or all evangelists belong to that group. He says at the time, the majority do not. I don't wish to be identified with them. I'm for morality, but morality goes beyond sex to human freedom and social justice. We as clergy know so very little to speak out with such authority on the Panama Canal or superiority of armaments issues at that time. Evangelists can't be closely identified with any particular party or person. We have to stand in the middle to preach to all people right and left. I haven't been faithful to my own advice in the past. I will be in the future. That was Billy Graham. Billy Graham did not want to be identified with what is called the religious right with culture war Christianity, this, this fusion of evangelical Christianity and far-right politics. He did not want to be identified in that group. Those of us who want to follow Jesus have a choice to make. We always have this choice, but this choice is stark here at the end of 2020. However you vote, whatever issues you support, we as followers of Jesus must, according to Jesus, be concerned about the things that Jesus is concerned about. He says what it's all about is doing to others what you would have them do to you. That's tzedakah. It's righteousness, justice and righteousness. And people who are not about that will be cast out by Jesus at the last judgment. We have a choice to make. I have a simple question for anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus here at the end of 2020. Who holds your primary allegiance? Jesus or your political party? Do you look to Jesus Christ to inform your values, your political beliefs, the way that you approach solving problems in America, the way that you think we should live into the ideals in our Constitution? Or do you just have beliefs you already hold and you just kind of want to baptize them, throw some water on them, and pretend they're Christian like C.S. Lewis said, Christianity and water, watered down Christianity. Who holds your allegiance, Jesus or your political party? So much of the division that we see in our society today, I believe, has to do with fear. The things Jesus was talking about in Matthew 25, fear of the other, fear of the stranger, fear of people who are different, wanting to protect our own interests, our own money, our own power, materialism, just wanting what's in it for us, not thinking about other people. But a lot of that is based in fear. Next Sunday, we're starting a new sermon series entitled Unafraid, Living with Courage and Hope in Uncertain Times. It's based on a book of the same title by Adam Hamilton. And every Sunday, the sermons will be, uh, will be based from the book, and it's the way it deals with, with Scripture about fear. And then every week on Wednesday night, we're going to have an online connect group led by Travis and Kristen Lovren. 
and they're going to be discussing the book, and that will coincide with the sermons every week. So it's going to be an all-church study of this, of this book, Unafraid. And we're going to be talking about what God has to say about fear. How do followers of Jesus deal with fear and worry and anxiety as we approach the presidential election in the United States? And, and one of the chapters does deal with politics and how fear plays into our politics, but about fear in, in every way in, in the human experience. And so I want to invite you to order your book and be a part of the Wednesday online uh, connect group studying this book. You can get more information at wellchurch.org uh, about, the, uh, about the group. And then to come back and, and join with us every Sunday as we talk about fear here at the end of 2020. I wanted to play you a quick promo. It's a one minute promo. This is Adam Hamilton, the, the author of the book about Unafraid. Let's watch. Most of us wrestle with some combination of fear, worry, or anxiety. For some of us, it's a daily battle. But the reality is, everyone worries about something. I'm Adam Hamilton, author of the new book and Bible study experience, Unafraid, Living with Courage and Hope in Uncertain Times. Over a five-week period, we'll explore the most common worries and fears experienced by Americans today. We'll consider the anatomy of fear, the actual physiological processes behind our experience of fear, then we'll explore proven practices to deal with our fear and to look at the important role faith can play in helping us live unafraid with courage and hope. While you may always have to live with a measure of fear, you don't have to live afraid. Join me together as we will come to understand that courage is not the absence of fear, but it is the act of doing, living, and being, despite our fears, secure in God's love. So I hope you'll pick up your copy of the book and uh, go to wellchurch.org and get information about the Wednesday night online connect group discussing the book and then come back next Sunday and join with us as we talk about dealing with fear here at the end of 2020. And then by the way, our next pub theology is October 6th, 6 p.m. here in Arizona, 9 p.m. Eastern. Our discussion question during the next pub theology, it's a Zoom meeting, the, the discussion question is going to be what are the most important issues to you in this upcoming presidential election? That's what we're going to talk about in our next pub theology, October 6. What issues are most important to you in the upcoming presidential election? We'll have a, a, a respectful dialogue about what's important to you. And the Zoom link is also at wellchurch.org. So finally, I want to talk about an example of what it can look like for a follower of Jesus Christ to believe in Tzedakah, justice and righteousness and work for the domestic tranquility and the general welfare, the general well-being of our country, the values that are in our constitution. And there was a pastor named Robert Greitz who passed away last week at the age of 92. And he was a, a Lutheran pastor in Montgomery, uh, Alabama in 1955 during the... Um, the Montgomery bus boycott that was led by Martin Luther King Jr. in Rosa Parks it started four days after Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. He was a white pastor of a, of a mostly black congregation in Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. And during this time, the local NWA, uh, in, in AACP, uh, I said NWA, I mean, you understand, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. The local NAACP met at his church for their meetings. And he was only, he was one of the only white leaders, white religious leaders, who was supportive of the civil rights struggle in Montgomery at that time. Long before it was, it was accepted by the majority of white people to say Black Lives Matter, this white Lutheran pastor in the 1950s Montgomery, Alabama, was an ally to fight racism. He was an anti-racist. And I, I imagine 
how, how lonely he must have felt at times. As a white Christian pastor, standing up for what he believed, and, and facing the reality that a sea of white Christians across this country viewed him as a traitor to their, their cause. They viewed Martin Luther King Jr. as a troublemaker. So many white Christians talk about Martin Luther King Jr. now in glowing terms. A large percentage of white Christians in 1950s America harshly criticized Martin Luther King Jr. Just like we hear a lot of white Christians criticizing movements to fight racism in 2020. I imagine how alone Robert Greats must have felt at times. Do you feel alone at times? As somebody who wants to follow Jesus and you believe in Zedekiah, justice and righteousness, but it seems like there are so many Christians who don't. Well, keep in mind that uh, the kinds of Christians that you see in the media, they're not even the majority of Christians in the United States. They're just really loud. And I imagine that Robert Greats was discouraged at times. His house was firebombed twice. He had little kids. His house was set on fire twice. But he, he was one of the few white leaders in his area to stand up and work for tzedakah, justice and righteousness, and the domestic tranquility, and the, and the general welfare, the general well-being of our citizens. And to me, people like Pastor Greats are an example. When we feel alone, when we feel like we're in the minority, we're not. But when we feel like we are, just to keep on doing the right thing, Jesus says that's what's going to count at the last judgment. Did you live for justice and righteousness? Did you want to do unto others as you would have them do unto you? That's what Jesus says is going to count. Many, many, Jesus says, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, we, we were Christians, we went to church, we held up Bibles, we did all these things, and he will say, depart from me, you evil doers, you reshaim. I never knew you. Because they weren't concerned about tzedakah, justice and righteousness. So what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? Or more generally, a person of faith, or more generally, somebody who wants to be a decent human being and work for justice and righteousness, no matter what your religion or no religion, no matter what your ethnicity, what could it look like? Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. We live in a time of of rancor, of anger, of name calling, of divisive politics. Fight for what you believe is right, justice and righteousness, but do it in a way that other people will join you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look around. Who's suffering? Who who doesn't have domestic tranquility? Who doesn't have, who is not experiencing welfare, well-being? And commit ourselves to justice and righteousness. And living out the ideals in our constitution. I invite you to pray with me. God, thank you. for tzedakah, justice and righteousness. Thank you that in a, in a time when our struggles as Americans are reappearing in stark relief, as they have a few times in the past, God, we're faced with a choice. Do I want to be a part of the tzedakim, the righteous? Or do I want to be indifferent? Or do I just want to actively work against justice and righteousness for my own benefit? Jesus, you say that on that day, out of all the people who claim to follow you and use your name and hold up a Bible and talk about Christianity and God and Christian values, you say what will really count are those who were committed to tzedakah, justice and righteousness, treating other people the way we want to be treated and doing what is right by everybody. Those are the only people 
who will be accepted by you. God, when we feel alone, may we remember people like Robert Greats, who undoubtedly felt alone, doing the right thing. And God, may we always look, as the, as the author of the book of Hebrews says in the New Testament, to the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And, and all of the political rhetoric and the posturing and the, the pretending, all that will fall away. And the real question is, for all of us, am I somebody who wants to follow Jesus Christ and work for justice and righteousness? Thank you, God, that we have the freedom to make that choice and we have the privilege and the calling to follow Jesus in that way. And we thank you that that can help us to perfect our country, to lead us to a more perfect union. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.